Okay, so um, we uh, are about to get started. So I want to welcome everyone um, to our uh, uh, April 20th, uh, 2022 Grand Rounds. Um, and uh, want to remind everyone that um, if you are on, please uh, mute your mic unless you have a question. So, we, so we're getting started today. So first of all, I wanna thank and welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Sarah Ross Schaefer, um, who, who uh, comes to us um, from uh, Mercer University School of Medicine, and she's at, the, she's at their Savannah campus. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Mercer uh, is going to speak to us today on the subject of rural autism spectrum disorder. Um, and she's gonna talk about both how diagnosis as well as solutions. Um, she uh, came into our area um, a couple years years ago, right? literally probably right a year or so before the COVID, which is I'm sure what an introduction to Savannah that was, but um, in 2018. And she has continued her work there. Uh, she reached out to us um, for potential collaborations and we look forward to working with her. So um, thank you all for attending today. We will have a few comments at the end of her presentation, but without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Rushhaver. I'll let her introduce herself, say a little bit about who she is and uh, her interests and then her presentation. So Dr. Rushhaver, the uh, mic is yours. Awesome, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, all right, I'll just take a minute to pull up my slides really quickly. Um, I will tell you that we do have a uh, I decided to present from home and naturally that was the day that um, my apartment decided to paint all the buildings. So there is a little noise outside. I apologize for that. If it becomes too annoying, please let me know. Can everybody see my slides? Yes, yes. we can. All right, thank you. <laughs> all right, so again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present here for you today. Um, as Dr. Telfer mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you about a bit about autism spectrum disorder in rural areas, uh, some of the barriers to getting diagnosed, and some possible solutions. So let's see, having a moment. Here we go. All right. <laughs> so uh, first I thought I'd talk to you a little bit just about me to introduce myself. So me right here, uh, Sarah Rutschafer. I'm originally from Minnesota, but I did my graduate work and my postdoctoral work in California. I did my grad work at UC Riverside where I started doing work on auditory processing and fragile X syndrome. So that was bench work, but fragile X syndrome is a condition on the autism spectrum. And then I continued that work when I did my postdoc at UC Irvine. And then uh, from there, I brought that work with me when I started working at Mercer. And um, I don't know how much you all know about Mercer, but you know it is a very mission-focused organization focused on um, attending to healthcare disparities in rural areas. Um, given that I had spent quite a lot of time in rural Minnesota, uh, that was a mission that really spoke to me. And so I used that as an opportunity to kind of you know, bring my autism work in and see if we could help some people and create some helpful resources for people in rural areas. Um, you probably all have some notion of what autism is, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I thought I'd do a quick little introduction. So autism spectrum disorder is a developmental disability caused by neurological differences. The nature of those differences can be pretty wide ranging. So things like differences in neurotransmitter levels, differences in brain topography, and um, even uh, some differences in brain size. There really isn't one cause of autism, but there are a couple of factors that are associated with incidence of autism. So that'd be things like uh, advanced paternal age, um, mothers taking epilepsy medications, there are certain genetic disorders that are associated with autism. So for instance, Fragile X, which was kind of my introduction to autism is in that category. A um, Couple other things. Um, one thing that is worth noting is the largest category of autism is idiopathic autism, meaning that you know, we're still kind of working on figuring out the various genetic causes and factors associated with it. Uh, autism is increasingly common in the US currently, or at least as of 2020, the CDC estimates that one in 44 children are diagnosed with autism or meet that diagnostic criteria. 
The majority are boys, um, but if you kind of want to put that in context, you know, think about a classroom full of kids. Based on those numbers, odds are at least one of those kids in the classroom will have autism to some degree or another. So what does autism look like? Uh, autism is diagnosed based on a few core behaviors, those being social communication deficiencies, a uh, tendency toward repetitive behavior, rigid thinking, and those uh, behaviors must be present early in development, just meaning, you know, you're not gonna have a 20 year old who suddenly develops these. These would be something present from, you know, early, early childhood. And you can kind of see those factors spelled out in the DSM-5 over here. And one thing I would point out, just because it is a point of confusion sometimes, um, these conditions or autism isn't really something that's explained by intellectual disability. Intellectual disability can be comorbid with autism, but it's not onto itself something that entails intellectual disability. Uh, autism has a few secondary symptoms that are typical of people with autism. So things like sensory processing disorders, GI issues, intense interests on certain topics, things like that. All right, so that's um, kind of a quick overview of what autism is. But if we're going to understand some of the issues associated with getting autism diagnosed, it helps to understand how autism is diagnosed. And so that's what we're going to go over right now. So autism is behaviorally diagnosed, meaning that there isn't like a single blood test or something like that that you could take to tell if somebody has autism or not. It's behaviorally diagnosed and how that works is um, ideally a trained clinician would sit down with a kid and do some behavioral testing according to some um, standardized behavioral measures like the ADOS or CARS-2 tests, which you can kind of see listed here. And then we have an example of CARS-2 right here. Uh, those contain age-appropriate modules for testing children's uh, linguistic skills, social skills, motor skills, things like that. And based on those tests, the clinician should be able to make a diagnosis of autism or not. Um, autism can be diagnosed fairly early on, can be reliably diagnosed at between 18 and 24 months of age. So, you know, ideally an early diagnosis is a little bit better. And ideally the process, and I'm gonna emphasize very much ideally here, the process looks something like this. A parent well-informed about the signs and symptoms of autism would notice those in their child. Or a clinician who you know, is very scrupulous about testing developmental milestones notice kids showing signs of autism. They refer the child to a specialist for further testing, that specialist being a developmental pediatrician, child neurologist, or child psychologist. And then that uh, clinician makes an appropriate diagnosis using those behavioral assays we just discussed. All right, so that's the ideal process, easy peasy. Unfortunately, in real life, there are a few pitfalls to diagnosis as spelled out here. So at that first step, um, we have a few errors and you know, missteps that can happen as a result of lack of ASD awareness in communities. So if a parent isn't well-informed about the signs and symptoms of autism, they're not gonna notice those in their children. So that we have you know, parents missing signs of autism. Kind of going hand in hand with that, there are some doctors tend to be a little more concentrated in rural areas that have maybe a dated or incomplete understanding of autism or are less tuned into the more subtle signs and symptoms of autism. So they could miss a diagnosis that way. Um, people in rural areas often live further from their primary healthcare provider and that has a couple of effects. Uh, it can cause missed doctor's appointments. Like if you have to drive 50 miles for your nearest uh, doctor, you know, that's going to have an effect over time. You're going to maybe miss some appointments and that can cause a uh, developmental screening to be a little inconsistent for a child. So those are some stumbling points associated with that first step. If we move on to the next one, where we're trying to have the child sent to a specialist, if you live in a rural area, un unfortunately, there are going to be fewer specialists in your area, or there's likely to be fewer specialists in your area. That means that if you do want to go to a specialist, you're going to have to drive further or take time off work or even consider an overnight stay, which culminates those logistical challenges. If a parent or a family is uninsured or has poor insurance, testing can be expensive. So those are some further barriers to testing. And then as we get to this last step, there's a few more maybe existential reasons that parents might be hesitant to get their children tested. Uh, the first is a stigma. If uh, you live in a community that has poor understanding of autism, they might not really know what autism is. 
and may think ill of you or your kid or your family if they're diagnosed with autism, so social stigma. Going hand in hand with that, if there's a lack of understanding, there's probably also a lack of social support within those communities. And then lastly, um, having a kid with a developmental disability can be expensive. They might need special clothes, they might need special classes, they might need special toys. Over the course of a childhood, all those things do add up. So on a macro level, all those factors can cause delays in diagnosis. Uh, well, autism can be diagnosed at as early as two years old. The average age of diagnosis nationally is 4.5 years. So that's a 2.5 year gap, which in children time and children brain development, that's, that's, that, that's, an, that, that's an age. Uh, compare that with us olds where our brains don't really change that much in two years. It's uh, completely different for kids. Um, unfortunately, no notable changes in the average age of diagnosis have really happened in the last decade, and that's in spite of some efforts to increase ASD awareness. Uh, part of that, in rural areas at least, can be attributed to the usual culprits, so things like dis barriers of distance, less healthcare, less autism awareness, and kind of just a cultural of self-sufficiency, where people are maybe a little less likely to go to the doctor. But there are also some challenges specific to diagnosing autism in rural areas. And that's especially important because a lot of Georgia is rural. So of Georgia's 159 counties, 120 of those are rural. Uh, so if you think about um, you know, the challenges associated with diagnosing autism and um, health, obtaining healthcare in rural areas, potentially then that affects a lot of people. That's compounded with the fact that of Georgia's 159 counties, 141 of those are medically underserved. And that's what's diagrammed in this image over here. We have the state of Georgia and all of our uh, underserved counties are highlighted in pink. So unfortunately that is quite a chunk of the state. So as you look at that though, kind of bear in mind, uh, the rates of autism don't vary between, count, between urban and rural areas. So rates of autism happen at equal rates. However, because of healthcare shortfalls and then challenges specific to diagnosing autism, rural children on average, um, or, or at least a greater percentage of rural children have delays in getting autism diagnosed. <laughs> So I've been banging on a little bit now about some specific challenges of diagnosing autism in rural areas, um, not to be coy, but you're probably wondering what they are now. Uh, just reviewing literature, I've, I've kind of grouped the four, uh, that is I've grouped the challenges I've been able to identify into four categories. So just quickly, those are improper uh, or inconsistently performed developmental screens, a lack of parental knowledge, a hesitancy to diagnose young children, and then social stigma associated with autism. So I'm just gonna go through those. So at the beginning of each of these um, slides outlining the four challenges I've outlined or I've identified, I have some quotes taken from a survey done by Elder et al. in 2016. So this was a survey of autism stakeholders in rural Florida. So these are either parents who've had a child go through the diagnostic process or educators. And they're just talking about their experience with um, autism and going through the system. And I included them because they're very poignant. And I think they do a very effective job of conveying the frustration people felt with trying to navigate the healthcare resources that they did have with regard to autism. And I think it puts a very human face on the struggle that these people are going through. So with our first challenge, we're talking about improper autism screenings. Just as a point of reference, the CDC recommends that children have um, developmental milestone testing done at their nine month, 18 month and 30 month well baby checkups. And that they have uh, autism screening done specifically at the uh, 18 and 24 month old checkups. So that's kind of the ideal, the standard. Unfortunately, uh, data does show that rural healthcare providers aren't maybe as good about doing those as would be ideal. Another issue is that uh, sometimes untrained individuals are doing the assessments. I mean, I did a survey of healthcare providers once that showed that interns were doing the testing, which isn't necessarily terrible, but it's also, you know, you do wonder about the standard of training then. And then also there's a tendency or at least as this uh, stakeholder pointed out, the 
questions and questionnaires used maybe aren't as subtle as they need to be to detect all symptoms of autism. They might just be geared at catching the higher ends or the more severe cases of autism and more subtle symptoms might go overlooked. Uh, just as an aside, that's especially important in addressing girls with autism because typically autism screens are kind of based on a male understanding of autism symptoms and girls tend to present slightly differently. So in that way, they could go overlooked. Our next challenge is a lack of parental credibility. Uh, fundamentally, this sort of comes down to a lack of ASD awareness in communities. How that plays out is that parents uh, might have a sense that something, that their kid's a little bit different, or they might be experiencing some abnormal behavior. If they are less educated about autism, they might have difficulty kind of assigning those symptoms, those signs that they're noticing to a specific diagnosis. They might not be able to say, I think the kid has autism. And so that manifests as when they go to the doctor, they're kind of talking to the doctor in sort of vague terms. They're talking about, you know, I just think the kid's a little off. And if the doctor is, you know, savvy, they might recommend developmental testing, but if not, they might just shrug and say, well, we'll see if they're still doing the thing in a year or so, you know, kind of kick the can down the road. Or if parents are unsure of what they're really seeing, they might be reluctant to even bring it up with the doctor. And that can introduce delays into the diagnostic process as well. On the flip side though, uh, kind of as mentioned, there is some hesitancy to diagnose children with uh, autism or young children with autism or suggest developmental testing. Um, that could come from a couple of different reasons. It could be that, you know, some clinicians are less knowledgeable about autism. They don't have a perf they don't have a as complete understanding of autism as would be ideal. It could be that they're unsure of how to proceed with a children child showing signs of autism, either just through ignorance of the process or because their communities don't have, you know, a lot of resources to help families with autistic children or children showing signs of developmental delay. And that could cause uh, doctors to take sort of a wait and see approach to um, dealing with kids showing signs of developmental delay. And then lastly, there's uh, the aspect of social stigma that might cause doctors and patients to be reluctant to pursue an autism diagnosis. And for this, you can kind of think of, um, you know, small town life where everybody sort of knows everybody else. If you, if as a parent, you put a name to the signs and behaviors that your kid is showing, that could end up labeling them as different. And if you're in a community that doesn't understand autism very well, that could lead to a misunderstanding of your child and the behaviors they engage in and kind of lead to some social ostracization. And that also can kind of apply to families too. They might not know who to talk to about the difficulty that they're going through, you know, caring for a child with autism. So that can be very isolating long-term. All right, so I've been banging on now for a bit about the importance of getting kids diagnosed early. And why is that? Uh, the short answer is just uh, therapeutic opportunities. So we had mentioned that there's this um, kind of 2.5 year gap in when children could be diagnosed and when they generally are nationally. And so why is that important? Uh, to conceptualize why that's important, kind of think about a two-year-old child and think about a five-year-old child and the differences between them. At two years old, kids are they're getting a pretty good handle on walking. Uh, mostly they have it, most of them have some words they can say and some simple phrases they can put together. Compare that with a five-year-old who not only can talk, but can sing and dance and um, have social interactions, can have friends, can have uh, engage in imaginative play. Uh, just as a neuroscientist, that's a world of difference uh, neurodevelopmentally. An incredible amount of brain development has to happen for those changes to occur. As kind of a corollary to that, though, if a child is experiencing a developmental delay, those um, changes or those uh, failure to hit those developmental milestones can quickly ramify. Just meaning that, you know, if a child is, has difficulty speaking, um, they're going to have difficulty saying words, they're going to have difficulty with language, they're going to have difficulty speaking. If they have difficulty walking, they're gonna have difficulty running and so forth. Uh, fortunately, there are early intervention therapies that can help children kind of make up for um, lapses in development or developmental delays. 
Uh, in the case of autism, probably the most famous one is, Earl, is uh, Applied Behavioral anal Analysis, or ABA, which you may have heard of. And uh, how that works is it targets specific behaviors that the child's having difficulty with. So if, it, for instance, if the child needs help learning to use the bathroom or tie their shoes, ABA therapy can be customized to help the child kind of overcome those hurdles. And it's incredibly effective long-term. Um, early use of um, ABA therapy is correlated with better cognitive outcomes long-term. So these are lasting all through the child's adulthood, into the child's adulthood. And it's also associated with better emotional regulation. But the caveat is these are more effective the sooner they're begun. Therefore, being able to quickly and um, efficiently uh, identify kids showing signs of autism will get them in, will hopefully put them, give them an advantage in getting treatment and therefore uh, give them a better long term outcome. Moreover, there are social and financial services available to people with autism and families who have a child with autism. However, a lot of those do rely on a child actually having a diagnosis of autism. So those are necessary to get help to get those services. There's also legal services for uh, children and families with autism. And again, um, diagnosis is going to facilitate getting help from those services. All right, so, so far, We've talked about how autism is a developmental disability caused by neurological differences. We've talked about the fact that rural communities face some unique challenges to getting autism diagnosed, and that a delay in diagnosis has kind of widespread effects for the child's life. It could be a loss of therapeutic opportunities. It could mean their family is missing financial opportunities and social support opportunities. So what's my lab doing about it? Um, uh, my lab has two projects geared at helping people in rural areas. Uh, the first one is our Autism Spectrum Disorder Resources in Georgia website, which is hosted for the uh, Georgia, Innovation, or Georgia Rural Health <laughs> Innovation Center hosted at Mercer. And then the other is a survey reviewing factors motivating rural parents to seek behavioral testing for their children. So I'm just going to talk a bit about those projects now. Our first one is the Autism Spectrum Disorder Resources webpage in Georgia, or in Georgia webpage. Really, the webpage has kind of two parts. The first is an interactive map geared at helping families and individuals find autism resources in their communities. And then the second part of it is a list of autism topics to help educate and inform families and individuals about um, autism treatment and just topics for people with autism. If anybody's interested, we do have the link down here to that web page, and I'd be happy to send that out after my talk, too. Uh, for the web page, we tried to assume the position of a, of a caretaker living in rural Georgia who might not know a whole lot about autism, but does have concerns about their child's behavior, and then try to fill in, you know, what sorts of things do they need to know? What should their next steps be? And so for the first part of that, we had our autism resources map. And you can see a screenshot of it right here. So we have the state of Georgia with all these little pins placed in, each pin representing some resource for people with autism. And were you to click on one of those pins, you would see something like this. So I've just highlighted a Hope Bridge Center in Savannah to kind of make the point. And it would show you where they are. It would show you their contact information, their phone number, their web page, kind of what you would need to get in contact with them. The idea here being like, let's say you're a family or a you know, parent over here in like Baker County, and you have a child who's showing some signs that you're a little concerned about. What resources are in your area? Hopefully you could go to this map and just sort of see what's nearby. Uh, the map also has a few other advantages, especially over just like a typical Google search. Uh, the first one being that there are, well, there are like organizations that say they serve Georgia or serve or work nationally. They're not always terribly user friendly. Um, it could be that they're saying they serve all of Georgia, but in order to figure out if they have a clinic in your community, you'd have to contact the mother organization. Hope someone gets back to you, hope someone gets back to you in a timely fashion, and hope that they actually do have something in your community. So that's a lot of extra steps for what's basically a yes or no question. Um, also, there's clinics that are associated with hospitals. So if you're in that hospital network, you know, ACEs, they can refer you to a clinic. 
However, uh, you could be in a situation where you're not in that hospital network, but there's a clinic just down the street and wouldn't it be nice if you could access them or at least talk to people at that clinic. Uh, then lastly, there are a few um, private practices that don't really have so much of an internet pre presence just because they are in a bit of a niche. When you do a search, they don't necessarily come up. So having you know, an easy way to find them would be beneficial. Also with the map, we try to take a sort of holistic approach to people's lives. Um, you know, while finding appropriate ABA therapy might be important for a child with autism, their life is more than that. They'll also need to have dentists who can handle people with sensory sensitivities. They'll need to have daycares that can handle um, children with developmental delays. It's kind of a whole host of things. And so we did our best to include resources like that too. And then lastly, um, as I'm sure you're aware, thank you Hollywood celebrities, there is a lot of um, misinformation about autism out there. And so with these, we kind of did our best to make sure that the people we're listing have appropriate training and the services that they're offering are scientifically valid. So that brings us to the second part of the webpage, which is our topics section. And really, um, we kind of tried to serve two purposes here. First, you know, if you are a parent who has a child that they're concerned about, what do you need to know right now? What are your next steps? And to that end, we have questions like, um, you know, does my child have a developmental delay? Are there financial resources and support for me and my family? Um, and we have those all the way through sort of lifestyle things. So we have everything from the kind of serious to the slightly frivolous like ASD and social media just um, kind of raising awareness about um, what autism looks like and what resources um, are available to people as their child ages. And so as an example of that, we have kind of our more serious topics, first steps with autism. So if a child does, is showing signs of autism, kind of the two big things that we'd like parents to know about are children first and babies can't wait. So those are onboarding institutions for autism testing. And so if parents need know nothing else, we'd like them to know that. But if you don't know, you don't know. So there's that information. Just some nice, easy first steps that they can take. Um, from there though, if they want, you know, assuming things kind of are starting to work out and they want to know just more about autism, we have, uh, for instance, an autism fact or fiction section. Um, again, there is a lot of misinformation about autism out there. So as they're, you know, Googling, they might come across some dubious claims and we wanted them to have a place where they could evaluate whether what they're seeing is in fact scientifically valid. So we have a fact and fiction section. Um, we want our webpage to be kind of ever growing. So this is kind of, we think of this as a living thing, something that we're going to be updating quite a lot in the future. Um, kind of our hit list, the important things we'd like to do in the next year or so is uh, get some good Spanish translation options in place, but then also generate some material for Spanish speakers. There are some issues with autism that are specific to Latino communities, and we'd like to make sure that those are addressed. As always, we're uh, ex look, always on the lookout for more ABA resources and adult, resor adult services to put on the map. And then we're also looking to upgrade our mapping software. I think we've kind of maxed out what we can do with our uh, free version of Google Maps and uh, we need something fancier. So we're open to ideas there. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is always to expand the selection of ASD topics, but we'd like to do it in a more targeted way. We'd like to integrate some user feedback options for our content. You know, if somebody's out there and they've got a question and you know, that would be a question that would be beneficial for other people to hear the answer to, we'd like them to have an avenue for telling us about it. We'd also like to put our web page in front of some focus groups. Uh, we just want to make sure that the information that we're presenting is, you know, useful, obviously. And then um, just to get some boots on the ground opinion on, you know, what do you wish that you knew when your child was first diagnosed that you'd like to tell other parents? And we'd like to find some way to feature that on our web page too. All right, so that's our first project. Our second project is surveying behavioral fact, or I'm sorry, surveying factors that motivated parents to seek out behavioral testing for children showing signs of autism. Really, we think about this question in two parts. First, what's, you know, what signs were kind of jumping out at parents that prompted them to seek out behavioral testing for their child? So that was kind of a big one, that was kind of one. And then the other was, were those signs different between rural caregivers and urban suburban caregivers? 
Uh, this was all kind of an aid of designing material that could be more efficiently targeted um, at people in rural areas and kind of pick up on and kind of address things that they were actually seeing and dealing with. So for this project, we partnered with Statesboro's own Michelle Zena over at uh, Behavioral Pediatrics of Rural Georgia. She graciously allowed us to have access to her electronic health record. And uh, we basically went through and looked at the intake forms of children who were ultimately diagnosed with autism. Uh, Dr. Zena uses the Valent EHR system, which is um, or, which provides a behavioral intake forms. So it's going to ask questions about you know, certain behaviors, how frequently those behaviors occurred when they were first seen, how severe they, they were, things like that. Um, but seriously, it's like 40 pages long. So we had to be a little bit specific in what we were actually asking. And uh, we focused in on four questions. Uh, the first was, um, were there urban rural differences in the first signs that caretakers noticed? Uh, what signs did children demonstrate noticeably? Uh, what referral process did caretakers follow? And what was the follow-up suggested by their physicians in their areas? Um, our sample then consisted of uh, 200 children, and you can kind of see where, we, where they were from in this heat map over here. So you can see we were drawing children from a pretty significant portion of southeastern Georgia, and um, our sample was uh, more boys than girls as typical with autism diagnosis. Oh, excuse me. About two thirds of them came from uh, urban zip codes or suburban zip codes. And then about a third came from rural zip codes. Um, in keeping with national averages, uh, children's first age or children's age at the time of their first appointment was about four years old. All right, so that's our sample. Um, so our first metric then, was looking at the signs first noticed by caretakers and by physicians. And what we found was really pretty exciting to us. We found that there actually were a few rural to urban differences in what signs were first noticed. In the case of caretakers, uh, urban caretakers were slightly more likely to notice um, concerning motor skills. So these would be things like uh, poor coordination or a tendency towards repetitive behaviors in children. Uh, rural physicians were a bit more likely to tune in to developmental delays. Um, so that's a bit more of a global collection of symptoms, just meaning that, you know, a child might not be like, uh, air quotes there, other children, or they might, you know, as a result of developmental milestone testing, be showing developmental delays. So that was really exciting to us that there were actually some urban to rural differences. And we expanded on that by looking at uh, the motor and sensory skills that uh, caretakers reported children having, and then comparing between urban and rural groups. So you can kind of see that we looked at a pretty considerable list of things. I mean, long list here. Um, there wasn't a significant difference for quite a few of them, but a few differences did jump out. So rural caretakers were more likely to notice children were having difficulty managing personal space, that they had difficulty using their hands together, um, and that they were picky eaters. Whereas uh, urban caretakers were more likely to notice if children were talking excessively, not waiting their turn to speak. Um, that was kind of intriguing, just because it suggests then that the lifestyles associated with different geographical locations are going to lend caretakers to be more tuned in to certain symptoms or certain differences in certain symptoms associated with autism. All right, so based on what we had found up till then, um, we then got a little bit curious about what sort of behavioral or what sort of referral process people were following in getting autism tested or getting you know, behavioral testing done. Uh, we had, um, we were looking at whether there were differences in primary care providers referring people, self-referrals, babies can't wait referrals, teacher referrals, or other. And for the most part, there really weren't a lot of differences between rural and urban people in terms of how they ended up getting behavioral testing. But one thing I did wanna point out is only about half of the people who ended up at behavioral testing clinic um, were there as a result of primary care physicians referring them, which I have to think has, is a number that could be improved upon a little bit, unfortunately. As we look at differences between rural, urban and rural, uh, oh my goodness, um, 
rural and urban referrers, there really aren't a lot of significant differences except in the category of self-referrals in that rural, uh, or rural respondents were slightly more likely to have self-referred for behavioral testing. That could be just that there's a lack of referring options in their area, or it could reflect more of a culture of self-sufficiency in rural areas. In either case, you know, we did see a significant difference there. Uh, from there, we moved on to what sort of uh, testing had or treatments had children had previously, and then what was suggested as follow up by their primary care doctors. Uh, one thing that jumped out at us was a significant number of just children generally had some sort of speech or language therapy prior to or kind of as ongoing prior to going for behavioral testing. So that was over half of the children were in some sort of speech or language therapy. Um, and uh, significantly more rural kids were in some sort of occupational therapy prior to going for behavioral testing. Um, kind of as a corollary of that, we looked at um, what follow-up care was suggested by doctors, and um, we did see kind of an interesting difference there. So rural doctors were, unsurprisingly, more likely to recommend kids go for occupational therapy. And then um, rural, or I'm sorry, urban doctors were more likely to recommend kids go through babies can't wait. And so if we're gonna kind of break down those results, it's possible that in rural areas, there are fewer you know, official ways to get autism diagnosed and treated. So occupational therapy might be the better way. It could be that through, you know, just as a fear of some sort of stigma, they don't wanna use the A word in dealing with autism. So possibly hoping to get some treatment through occupational therapy. Um, or it could just be, you know, understanding of autism could be a little bit better. And so that's the route we're going. Um, urban people using babies can't wait. Uh, it, it stands to reason that, you know, if you are in a place that has more babies can't wait resources, you're more likely to use them. So that could lend uh, urban doctors to be more likely to use sort of the official pipeline in getting kids uh, diagnosed with autism, or at least tested for um, uh, uh, behaviors associated with autism. All right, so what does it all mean? In summary, we found that there were some notable differences between the signs of autism that uh, urban and rural kids were showing as reported by caretakers. We found that um, overall physicians maybe could be a little more aggressive in pushing um, behavioral testing for kids who are showing signs of autism and that the approach that doctors were taking to um, follow up for kids showing signs of autism or developmental delay did differ between urban and rural areas in that um, rural clinicians were more likely to recommend something like occupational therapy, whereas urban ones suggested something like babies can't wait. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me to speak to you today. And I was wondering if anyone had questions. Anyway. Thank you very much, Dr. Rorschaber. So we are um, opening up now for questions and that was, a, we went, that was a phenomenal presentation and we look forward to that. So uh, first question um, I have, I'll start it off. Um, uh, in that you've reached out to us to work with you and you work with um, one of our, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Zena, mm -hmm. uh, where do you see uh, us in, in public health as, as um, working with you. I mean, we have uh, some phenomenal persons who work in the maternal and child health, uh, mm -hmm. which is a major area in public health, as you know, but mm -hmm. there's other areas. So where do you see us sort of intersecting with your work? Um, one thing that I really would like some help with is uh, the Spanish speaking component of the work. Um, you know, somebody to help with translating, somebody to help write material would be really helpful. Um, I'd also like, uh, I'd like to be able to recruit a few more people who are actually doing some behavioral testing. Um, I mean, Mercer is helpful there, but, you know, bigger, the bigger the net, the better and probably the better outcome I'm going to have. And then um, just 
uh, kind of, you know, raising awareness. Like if there are people who um, would like to learn more about autism, um, we'd like to talk to them. Really, I've kind of found that um, sort of just talking to people actually has had some really good returns on figuring out directions to go and interesting ways to expand the work. Okay, well, thank you for that. A couple mm -hmm. comments though. We have a comment from uh, Dr. Um, let's see, in our thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we have uh, Dr. Chopak Foss. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, Dr. Peace, call Peace, um, asked, did you adjust your P values for multiplicity of comparisons? I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to tell you, I did work with a statistician on these. And um, I know it's kind of an unsatisfying answer, but I would assume she, you know, followed the appropriate uh, conventions, but I don't know offhand. I can ask her if, you know, that would be helpful. Okay. Well, Dr. Peace, did you have anything you want to add before we move to the next question? Uh, I've uh, turned my sound on. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, not not really. Although I would say that uh, uh, these results are not likely uh, to to be seen as um, as uh, uh, confirmatory mm -hmm. uh, of uh, underlying um, phenomena. Uh, rather uh, hypothesis generating. And for that reason, it doesn't matter whether the p-values were adjusted for multiplicity of comparisons or not. So I suspect they weren't, but uh, there's nothing wrong with that for the purpose of generating hypotheses to study further. And uh, what you get is a, a, a possibility of phenomena that may be real and those could be tested with follow-up uh, studies. Yeah, so do Dr. Rush, for your information, Dr. Mm -hmm. Peace is, is our esteemed, one of our esteemed biostatistician and oh. professor as well uh, in mm -hmm. our college. So um, that's coming, for, that's his question. And I'm sure if there's follow-up, he will do that. Thank you, Dr. Peace. Um, Absolutely. So, we're going to uh, our other esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Beck Foss. Um, do you want to, uh, your comment was, it's a fantastic information. She, she appreciates it. Um, and she said that we want uh, the self-contained classroom um, in our elementary school. I don't know if you want to elaborate a little more on that, Dr. Chopak Foss, I'm not quite following your comment. Okay. I'm glad you found the data to be helpful and interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, she can't access audio, so we'll we'll have to. She'll have to follow up with you on that. Um, your comment, Dr. Rushaver, about Spanish translation. We actually happen to have a very good um, professor, a new professor to our college, Dr. Palacios, who mm -hmm. who is, uh, instant, you know, coincidentally um, an MCH. Uh, 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 interest person as well as specialist. So um, uh, for maybe uh, one of our, Dr. Orca Ramade, we can, you, you, I think we've sent you her name already, Dr. Mm -hmm. Palacio. So she would be someone you would reach out to for that translation. Okay, okay. so we do have uh, a hand up uh, that I see that is from our Dean, uh, Dr. Dean, Dr. Stuart Tedders um, and Dr. Tedders. Hey, uh, Sarah, thank you so much for, um spend a little bit of time with us. I, I really appreciate this. You, you wouldn't know this, but um, uh, I spent the first several years of my professional career at Mercer University School of Medicine. I was really? based in, in Macon, okay. Um, okay. Georgia. And it was during that time they actually established the, the Savannah campus. And mm. so I was, I sort of saw that evolve and it's grown into something much bigger than I ever um, uh, even imagine, but it's an, it's an outstanding program that you all have, um, a, a very noble mission. Uh, as you know, you alluded to that, um, oh, yeah. and doing great work turning out primary care physicians, but my, I don't really have a question. It's really more, mm -hmm. of, a, more of an editorial comment, as you know, and mm -hmm. uh, presumably others on this phone call know, um, out of the 159 counties that are in the state of Georgia, there may be 
haven't checked the data, but it would not surprise me if at least a third of those counties didn't have a pediatrician. Um, probably at least that many, if not mm -hmm. more, probably don't have the capacity to deliver uh, uh, psychiatric services. Mm -hmm. um, so, as a, and of course, most of these are in, in, are in rural Georgia, but as mm -hmm. it relates to uh, providing uh, early diagnosis as well as uh, early intervention, um, mm -hmm. rural populations are, are very limited in terms, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they would rely exclusively on just basically a well-informed parent or physician. Yeah. And uh, it's, I've never really thought about it, but it's a, it's a massive uh, uh, problem and, and there are tremendous um, um, disadvantage. So COVID has done a lot of bad things, Sarah, but one of the things that, it, that I think good has come out of it is, is I think that it's um, allowed us to understand and leverage technology a, a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, on, on a lot of different levels, but I'm curious to know if you have any thoughts about how maybe telehealth could be used to maybe uh, reach some of these disparate populations in rural uh, areas to, to address this problem. Oh, I do. Um, so one thing that was kind of interesting to me just in talking to you know people who do do autism testing and treatment is they actually really like it, the telehealth. Just because if you think about somebody who does have autism, you know, generally they don't like changes in their routine. They don't like going to new places with people they don't know. And so being able to do treatment and like kind of training parents through telehealth is really kind of nice for people with autism and, you know, people who have a autistic family member. Of course, kind of the flip side of that is, you know, technology isn't, um, or like internet access isn't great everywhere. So, you know, kind of we're limited a little bit in that way. So there is like, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a great resource, really. Um, people seem to like it, it seems to be efficient. And then the other side of that is, um, one thing I didn't really talk about here, but we're hoping to develop a CME course or like an ECHO course, if you guys are aware of Project ECHO, um, where basically that's kind of some um, online training and camaraderie for physicians working in rural areas. And we think that'd be a really great way to kind of help people learn a little bit more about autism and kind of some follow-up steps for it. I mean, I, I hope I didn't come across as too hard on clinicians in my talk, because really, I mean, as you say, physicians in rural areas, they're wearing a lot of hats and they really are doing the Lord's work. It's just that, you know, autism is becoming so prevalent and the consequences of not detecting it early can have such a lifelong impact on kids, you know, we don't want to miss cases, really. So a little bit of education that way could go a long way. And I think telehealth or like um, teleconferencing would be really helpful in that regard. Does that answer your question? It does. I, and I really appreciate your comments. Um, and okay. I know that you're, uh, you know, I'm not sure how much you know about the Jinping Sioux College of Public Health. Um, <clears throat> but if I would really appreciate the opportunity, I'm sure I speak for others to maybe sit down and, and be able to tell you about what our capacity is in the area of scholarship mm -hmm. and programming. Um, uh, we, we cover all aspects of public health and we, we have tremendous scholars in our college, um, you know, biostatisticians, of course, but also uh, community health uh, policy, um, epidemiology, uh, behaviorists and whatnot. So um, would look forward to building uh, bridges and collaborations with Mercer University. Certainly. Um, if it's all right with you, I'd like to follow up with an email and we can see about setting something up. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Telfair is the, the dean in charge of uh, practice and research. So I'll, uh, if you could loop him in on those on, on that email, I would really appreciate it. Got it. Definitely. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Tedders, for um, for that. And, and um, j just as a uh, information, which Dr. Tedders, you may not know, uh, the reason why we we even have Dr. Um, Roche for today is because she did reach out and we did have a conversation before, but it's always good to have, a, and we had promised each other that we would have a follow-up conversation. Um, and we've given her the names of a number of faculty members, um, you know, that you have. So I just want to um, uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Ms. Kiel, um, who... Uh, is works with Dr. Sullivan, who you, you, you named that I've mentioned to you. And I think she has a few comments. She also works with Dr. Uh, Zena as well. So Ms. Okay, Kale, please sure. speak up. 
Hi. Hi, yes, thank you, Dr. Telfair. Um, so yeah, I am partnered with Dr. Sullivan. We are currently working on um, a project. We'd love to connect with you also. Um, oh, awesome. But on your presentation, it was great, um, but I was curious to know what your, uh, the center at Mercer is doing to kind of help um, bridge the gap of those kids who have missed that early diagnosis and maybe they're a little bit older. Um, yeah. And I mean, my impression is for Savannah, at least, um, initiatives sort of come and go with regard to autism, depending on who's interested. And I mean, we'd like to try to, so to that end, um, kind of at least while I'm at Mercer, I'd like to do my best to sort of create a little more institutional care and awareness for autism, just because they're so well positioned to address it. Um, right now, you know, we do have the website, which helps um, for kids who've kind of missed the window. Um, unfortunately, within the state of Georgia, from what I can tell, there really aren't a lot of great, you know, young adults, adult resources out there. Um, I think fundamentally, you know, I can, you know, raise awareness all day, but fundamentally what we need are more doctors who are able to recognize autism and kind of act on that. And so that's one thing that I am kind of pushing in the Mercer curriculum. I'm about to actually teach a course about child development, which will hopefully have kind of an emphasis there. Uh, Dr. Zena is taking on a few of my students um, as interns this summer. So I think they're gonna have a great time and hopefully they'll learn a lot. Um, kind of as next steps, I mean, if we were able to get some sort of grant, I mean, I'd love to be able to, you know, kind of think through just looking at autism holistically, you know, like getting a kid diagnosed is one thing, but then that means that they're diagnosed with a condition that they'll have for the rest of their life and potentially needing uh, care. So creating networks um, or even just kind of expanding what's already in Atlanta to the rest of the state would be really helpful. I'm not sure how we would do that, but I think kind of expanding Atlanta resources would probably be the best first step. I feel like that was a little bit rambly, but did that at least answer part of your question? It did. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So thank you. All Anybody right. else before we close? All right. So thank you, Dr. Warshaver. We are truly, truly appreciate the excellent presentation and the and the uh, the discussion um, mm -hmm. of where is ways that we as a college can collaborate with you on your outstanding work. So we look forward to, as, as Dean Tedder said, we look forward to the looping you back in and that, and I strongly encourage you, I think we probably send you way too many names, oh. person, but, um, but we think that all of these persons would be very interested in, in, in having a conversation with you. And I think you have several that are just right in your area, like Dr. Palacios, for example, um, who I know would be very interested in speaking to you. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Dr. Sullivan would as well, given the mm -hmm. scope of her work and her research, um, mm -hmm. and um, as, as well as other persons. So uh, we do look forward to having you back. So for All everyone right. else, um, thank you very much. Again, we appreciate that. We want to um, say thank you, Dr. <laughs> Barshaver, um, and we appreciate your time, and we look forward to bringing you back. Thank you, everyone, for our session today. We have one more coming up next week, and that is uh, going to be in you know some internal uh, faculty. We have Dr. Marshall and then uh, Ms. Cook, um, and we look forward to that. And again, uh, please uh, remember we will will um, always appreciate any feedback you give us or and any recommendations for persons we can bring together, um, and we work with that. So thank you for your time. And, and, and everything else. And we hope you have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. Uh, take care of yourselves. Bye. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.